And I just want to do a little bit more in your book under construction. And if we look at house styles on page 144, if we look at your book, page 144, those are all homes around Western New York. Split level, colonial, colonial are always two story homes. Uh, Tudor has half timbering. It's like the. Um, as I go through this list, I'd like you to uh, respond because you know I'm very big on the being actively participating in the program. Tell me what style home you live in, and if you don't live in a home and you live in an apartment, tell me the last home you lived in, or a relative's home, and just let me know. Uh, I just want to see you can make the connection there. Okay. Uh, Cape style home. When I lived in Tonawanda, I actually lived in a Cape style home. Uh, I had a Cape with dormers. Uh, dormer is a section of the um, second floor that uh, protrudes out and gives you more living space. Um, you have Georgian Colonial, Ranch or Rambler. A Rambler is another uh, name for a one-story home in other parts of the country. Not so much in Western New York. You don't see... Uh, you know, in Rochester, Buffalo, most of upstate New York, you don't see Rambler being used. But in other parts of the country, Texas and uh, elsewhere, they sometimes they use the word Rambler. So it's a one-story home. I've lived in a ranch home before. Uh, I've lived in an old-style home. Now, old-style is an interesting uh, concept. I can't tell you I've seen that in many places outside of New York. I've done a lot of traveling over the years. And uh, old-style is uh, one of the big things with old style is it has to be a home that was built in the late 1800s up to the early 1900s, up to about 1930s-ish. So if the home falls in that date range, old style will be proper, number one, okay? And number two, uh, as we talk about old style, it's a two-story home, but you don't necessarily know from the outside of the home whether that second floor is all functional living space. In other words, from the outside of an old style home, it could be an attic in the front, an unfinished attic, or the attic could be in the back, or that whole second floor could be unfinished space. Now, there's a probably Stephanie's probably having a whiffle moment right now. What's in it for me? Why do I care? You should care about this because it's really easy for people to have finished that second floor and turned it into a nice living space without a building permit. Number one, number two, uh, well, without a building permit, that means it's illegal. That means you inherit the problem if you don't say anything about it. Which means that, you know, if I'm the buyer of a home and you're representing me, oh my God, it's, it's, it's I, I, are you noticing right now that if you did this sheet that we just referenced, it's like the circle of life. This is like a Disney movie right now. So if you have a sheet that says everything you want to know is a buyer and everything you want to know is a seller and you tell your buyers and sellers, mostly your buyers on this one, that they should go check to see if there's building permits for work that was done because otherwise they inherit the problem, or they might find out, like say I bought a property in Lancaster and it only had this, the, it was a three family and it only had one point of egress to get into the property. And I know from being a home inspector that, you know, if there's a fire and there's only one way out, it's not really gonna be, uh, it's not safe, okay? But, I went to the building department and they told me that it was grandfather. And I said, oh, great. That's good. I'm happy. It's grandfather. Um, can I get that in writing? And believe me, now I got that in writing. I have copies of it. I have scanned it. I have it with legal papers. Like there's no way I'm going to lose that form because someday when I turn around to sell that property, I don't want them to say, oh, no, we never said it was grandfather. And that's the way you need, ladies and gentlemen, that's the way you need to think about things in real estate. You can't just take someone's word for it. You got to get it in writing. And when people have to commit to putting something in writing, all of a sudden, the quality of the information matters more. Okay? 
sorry I went off on that, but I kind of think what I shared with you is pretty important. And I think it's great that when I talk about the circle of life in real estate, at least, that that sheet that I hope you make, I challenge you to make that sheet, okay? Matter of fact, make that sheet, send us a picture on our text line, and that will just put a warm, fuzzy feeling in my heart. Like I'm talking about putting good things into the universe. That will be fantastic if you did that, okay? Because I really think, you know, it, it's one of those things that you don't know what questions to ask if you don't know what questions to ask. And how do you, like, you know, now you know. You can never unknow what I've just shared with you. You'll never make the same decisions when you purchase a home again or when you rent again or when you sell again, okay? So as we continue looking at the pictures here, uh, you'll see that we, you might say to yourself, old style, you know, it looks like a two-story home. Why don't we just call it a two-story? We don't call it a two-story for a particular reason. And again, that has to do, you're not going to be tested on this per se. Actually, none of these home styles you're tested on. It just it seemed to me wrong. When I wrote this book, it seemed to me wrong that to not explain house styles. I don't want you leaving a real estate program and being like, oh, well, we never learned about how to tell this house from that house. And when you look at uh, tax records from local municipalities, particularly in urban areas, it's very common in urban and rural areas to see old style listed. You'll see that nine out of 10 times it will fall, well, maybe eight out of 10 times, it will fall in that definition that we described for you. Okay, from the late 1800s to the early 1930s-ish. And, uh, and that some part of that second floor or all of it might be unfinished space. And it's interesting calculating the square footage of those homes. Uh, I have to tell you that um, a lot of assessors, and I found particularly in the dirt, like when I would do appraisals and when I you know, listed and sold, I listed and sold in, in the Hamburg, New York area. So I, I really know the Southern tier well, and then I've appraised all over Western New York. Um, with, with, uh, with a raised ranch or bi-level home, usually we call it a raised ranch. Other parts of the country, they call it bi-level. Um, when part of the area is finished below grade, so if you're, let's say, you know, you look at the picture and you'll see where you walk up a couple of steps to the right of the garage, okay? By the way, that garage, we don't call that, uh, that has a particular name to it, okay? Does anyone know what we call that kind of garage? It's not attached and it's not detached. We have another name for that. Anybody know what we call a garage that's not attached or not detached? Starts with a B. And this is exactly the definition of it. Built in. We call that a built in garage because you have living space above it. So if you walk in, let's say you walk into that garage and then you go to the right, you'll typically have a partial basement there. Sometimes people say, well, what's the definition of a partial basement? The one that we always followed as appraisers uh, that I've always taught people over the years is if you have 70% of the first floor living area or more, so whatever the square footage of the basement is, you don't count the garage as part of the basement, even though it's at the same level. So the, ba the basement portion that's unfinished typically even if it's finished it doesn't matter because it's below grade being below grade is what makes a basement a basement okay so 70 percent or more of the first floor area makes it a full basement less than 70 percent of the first floor makes it a partial basement so I've seen partial basements as small as 10 by 10, just enough room for a washer and dryer. So in that circumstance, you would, you would check the box on the profile sheet that says partial.
So when you let, but that, that basement could be finished with, with two bedrooms down there. Well, if you, if you look out the window and you see dirt that goes up to within a couple of inches of the ground and it's landscaped in such a way that half of that or a third of that wall area of that basement is surrounded by topography, that is considered basement, not above grade square footage living space. So sometimes if the assessor did their job properly, and believe me, there's mistakes that you'll see out there, you'll see 900 square feet, 880 square feet. That's real common in Angola. Remember the first house I ever sold on John R. Drive in Angola had, um, I think it was like 970 square feet. If I, re I don't know why I remember that. I'm pretty sure I'm close. Um, yeah, it was, it was that situation. And sometimes you only have a few inches of dirt in that area. So you want to make sure when you're looking at property, I'm getting a lot of questions I got to look at, but I want to lose my train of thought. So uh, you, when you're in the basement and you're trying to determine, you, you can't have a full basement and a finished basement and a slab. Like you got to pick what you're going to, you can't double dip. So if you're going to, if you're only a couple of inches of soil around and it's the lower level of the home, but it's mostly above grade, I mean a lot mostly, not a little mostly, okay, then, then you got to say that that home has no basement. The basement is a slab as compared to it's got a full basement, it's better to be on slab than to call it a basement because then you can count the square footage. But the assessor might not have agreed with you. But then keep in mind, the assessor may have never entered the home. So in that circumstance, we want to make sure that, you know, there's probably less value for tax purposes doing that. You know, maybe you kind of see where I'm going with this whole thing here. In other words, we want the number to be as high as possible when we sell it for the seller. We want the number to be as low as possible when we're representing that property to the municipality, specifically the assessor, okay? Let me know if you don't get that for some reason. I think I sort of pretty much told you how that works. I wanna just look real quick at the questions here. Um, so Stephanie's in a colonial. Uh, Akela is in, oh, so Akela is in a old style home. Okay. So Akela, tell me this. Is the entire second floor finished or is it partially attic, unfinished? Let me know about that. Okay. Um, Stephanie, Akela, okay. So Colonial, I think. Gino lives in a Colonial. I have a two story with living space in the side and also a garage attached to that. Okay. Uh, I was going to live in a ranch rambler. Okay. Um, Emily's in an apartment complex. We lived in a Cape once before. Okay, good. So you get that. Now, Emily, did you have a dormer? Did you have like an extra protrusion where if you looked at the back of the home or the side of the home, there was like a little part that jutted out? Because here's the thing with capes. You um, sometimes you, you don't have fully functional floor space. Like when you walk up to the end of the floor space in the second floor of a cape, and unless you're three feet tall, which is not practical, you know, I mean, some people are, but you know, you walk up to the end of the floor space. And, and, the, and the floor is like, like this. This part here, right, this part here is not functional space. So, uh, but a dormer opens that up so that it becomes more functional so that, you know, three quarters of an average human height can use that. You know, you can put like a piece of furniture there or kids could play there if it's a kid's room or whatever. So let me know about that, uh, Emily, if, if there was a dormer at that at that cape. Um, did you see here, here's, here's, what if the basement, oh yeah, yeah, so actually, G, uh, Gino, was Gino, this was your question, I think you had texted over about if the basement was uh, used as, um,
for storage. It doesn't matter what you use it for. It matters what it could be used for. So let's say you buy a home with a finished basement. And now that you know this, you can't, again, you cannot unknow what I've told you. And, and you say, oh, crap, you know, they didn't get a building permit. But I'm not going to use it that way. I'm just going to store things there. Um, when you sell that house, you got a problem then. You know, you can only pray, pray to the housing gods that the people that buy it will do the same thing you did. But those gods don't respond well to me. I know that that would not be, it would be not good. So don't bank on that, you know. Um, yeah, so I don't want to repeat all of that again. Um, so Emily, three in the front. Michaela, yours, so that old style home that Michaela lived in is, was the entire second floor unfinished? Let me know, Akela, if that was completely unfinished. I'm curious. Uh, or just part of it, okay? Uh, Emily, I don't know what you mean, three in the front. Um, you mean three feet in the front part? I don't know what you mean by that. Uh, the question for Emily originally was, um, did you have a dormer? Or are you saying you had three dormers? Oh, you said three dormers. Okay, there you are. That means you had more functional living space, which is terrific. Uh, Kayla here. So, well, some of the front of the house was turned into a room, but the back still looked like an attic. Oh, okay. So, and that's the tricky thing. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a tricky thing about an old style house. You don't know until you get inside how much of it's finished or not. And, and it, when you're picking comparables... Again, it's a circle of life. Why do we care about all these things? When you're picking comparables and you're driving past them, because that's really what you should do. Most agents don't, but you should. Because you might be taking pictures of them. Because technically, you know, you're not supposed to be using other people's pictures, when, especially when you're marketing a property. Um, typically for a CMA, comparative market analysis, the rules are a little looser on that. Um but as an appraiser, I need to take pictures of my comparables. I'm supposed to take the pictures, not me use what's in the multiple listing system. Some banks don't like that. Many banks don't like that because they want to make sure that I'm just going based on someone else's information, and that's what you're doing. So when you go buy a property, you know, and you take a look at it, and it looks different from, you know, people make mistakes, and, you know, and if you follow someone else's mistake, then you're the one that's bad because you should have had the not secondary information, you should have the information as primary, something you could have confirmed, okay? Um, okay, so that's good. That's all good stuff. So, yeah, so take a look, you know, um, the other big things I want to bring to your attention on page 144 is the contemporary. We have, there's two broad categories of housing styles. I just want you to have this, uh, wrap your head around this for a moment. Contemporary and traditional. You should just know that, not because you might be on real estate jeopardy someday, but just because it's just good to know. I, you know, I just, I just, I just want you to be as smart as possible. Okay, so contemporary and traditional. Traditional is what you typically see around that general part of the state. So split level, Colonial, Tudor, Cape. Georgian Colonial, Ranch, Old Style, that would all fall under the broad category of traditional. So the definition of contemporary is lots of glass, lots of weird shapes. I know that doesn't sound professional, but that's really what it is. You know, there's lots of crazy angles in contemporary style homes. Um, um, so yeah, so Crane Ridge is a subdivision in Colden. I believe it's on 391, but whatever the street is that gets you to Kissing Bridge, I don't ski because if I skied, I would die. I, I, I know I would break, I would break many bones, so that's why I don't ski. Uh, but if if you go to Crane Ridge, that's the best example of a whole humongous subdivision of contemporary style homes. There's a group of buyers out there, and maybe you know yourself. Um, matter of fact, real quick, just because I, you know, I love to get you actively involved. You tell me if you're thumbs up or thumbs down the contemporary style. A lot of people don't like contemporary. 
And when you're picking comparable sales, if you have a contemporary style home, you better use comps that are contemporary because it's a whole different dynamic with buyers when you're using comps that are traditional and not contemporary when the subject property is contemporary. So if you're a fan of contemporary style homes, let me know on the chat here. I'm curious as to whether or not, um, oh, Gino went so far as to say modern contemporary. So that's as contemporary as contemporary gets. And not all contemporaries created equally. Morgan's a thumbs down. Um, I'm generally a thumbs down. You know, it's kind of like I can take a little bit of contemporary in a home, but a lot of bit of contemporary, I can't, I can't do a lot. I just can't. Personally, that's, that, that's me. And I found, you know, all the years that I work with buyers and talk to buyers and have friends, it, traditional really does win out. And it turns out that most of our housing stock is traditional, not contemporary. I'll even go so far as to tell you that on Klein Road, I think it's West Klein, I forget which Klein it is, but it's Klein Road. There's a house at the corner of a street. I don't know what the other street is, but it's really not too far from Transit Road. And it's a contemporary style home that's always, I, I don't know if you get by that area at all, but it's always for sale and it's always foreclosed. Like it, I think it's been, it was foreclosed at least four times that I'm aware of. It's like, I don't know what's going on there. It would all, it almost, if I had to, if I had, I have fantasies sometimes of having lots of free time and not knowing what to do with myself. If I had time to research, I would almost tell you that more contemporary style homes get foreclosed on than traditional style homes. All things held equal. And considering the fact that so much housing stock is traditional, I think it would be real interesting to see what percentage of contemporary compared to if you compared um, side by side. I, I, I would I would tell you, I, I bet you, I bet you, but I, I just don't have time to prove it. Um, but yeah, we've got uh, ooh, we got a lot of thumbs downs on the uh, Stephanie, you can't pick, you can't go both ways, Stephanie. You need you need to pick, you need to pick, you need to pick one. So you just negated your answer. You can't you got to pick an answer. But um, yeah, a lot. That's most of your buyers are like that. They're not going to be big on, uh, they're not going to be big on um, contemporary. But that's like you know that's not your problem. You know you're going to show people homes that don't meet your style requirements. That you know some people are going to love really ugly wallpaper. And you have to, um, um, you you have to like you you have to be neutral when it comes to showing homes. Like your your personal style is like you'd be out of your mind to tell people how awful something looks when they might just absolutely love it. But I, I'm sure you know that. I'm sure that I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Um, too much sunlight. Don't want to wake up to that. Yeah, um, it's yeah that happens, right? Lots of windows will do that. And believe me, if you want a little incentive about whether you should go contemporary or not, check out the prices for custom blinds compared to blinds that you can get from a traditional store, and that might give you incentive to not want to go contemporary because wow, it's so expensive. Like it's mind blowingly expensive when you try to um, get custom blinds compared to traditional. Uh, can you even get blinds? Yeah, see? Um, okay, and Stephanie made the executive decision that she can go both ways on the uh, style. So yeah, so do I argue with a woman? No, 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 never win that argument. So page 145, we've got more pictures here for you. Uh, we show you where um, uh, soffits are, uh, remember, soffit is a part that's underneath the rafter. You want to understand, um, take a look at the pictures and get familiar with that. Some of you have different editions, so maybe your pictures look a little bit different. Um, I want to talk about GFCI on page 146, uh, ground fault circuit interrupter. Um, so with a GFCI, it detects a 0.6 milliamp difference going in or out. And that will trip a GFCI if it's wired properly. So part of what we do as a home inspector is we have 
a test for that. And don't think that a test for a GFCI is just pushing the button that interestingly says test because it's a mechanical test, kind of like a smoke detector. You know, you might have noticed that a, um, a smoke detector is um, it has a test button on there. You push it like, okay, the word smoke detector works. Actually, it just tells you that the battery works. The way to know that a smoke detector works is to go purchase online, uh, or if you can find it, it's hard to find. You should buy mine online. They have a, a can of smoke particulate where you can spray a can that has like something that's not quite smoke, but the equivalent of it. And if it goes off, then you know it would go off during a real fire. And uh, you have to have a GFCI tester, electrical tester, to really make sure that a GFCI will go off when you want it to go off, okay? You want to be familiar with roof types? Make sure you know uh, the various types of roof styles that we've got. Uh, gable on the left is very popular in Western New York. Hip roofs are more expensive. Architecturally speaking, they're more expensive. Um, mansard roofs, um, not real popular. Some people go so far as to say kind of ugly as well. But, um, you know, you know these for test purposes. And if you remember yesterday, we were speaking about that RFP rule about being able to paint so much as far as uh, if it was built prior to 1978 or not. Uh, that's all discussed uh, at the bottom of 147. You have more pictures on page 148. Always know, I would say some of the most important parts of this to know is your ridge pole. The ridge is the highest wood framing member of the house. You wanna know the highest and you wanna know the lowest. The lowest is a sill. Highest is a ridge, lowest is a sill. I feel like I'm going to ask you questions about this when we meet again next week on Tuesday. Okay, we're going to stick with the same time, same everything. Okay, so kind of take a look at that. The popular answer people pick for the lowest wood framing member is sole. That is not the right answer. Don't pick sole, pick sill, S I L L. Sill is the lowest wood framing member. And actually, we use anchor bolts, and you'll see that discussed in here. Anchor bolts is how we attach the skeleton framing member of the house to the substructure, the foundation. Okay. The bottom of 148, we talk about radon. You should know that radon, this shows up on the state exam quite a bit. Radon is an odorless, tasteless gas. It comes from the breakdown of uranium, okay? So um, the only way to get to know if you have a radon problem is to have a radon test done. Most home inspectors, when you uh, start meeting professionals in the business, you want to find out you know, which ones provide the test. New York doesn't have a specific license to be a, a radon technician. That's the term. Radon technician are people who test and then a separate laboratory provides the results, okay? Um, but there is a website, and you might wanna write this down. There's a website to find out about all the tests that have been done all over Erie County. There, I don't, I don't know of this, I don't know of this for other outlying counties. But since a lot of you will be working within the Erie County, or at some point will, you just want to go to Google and you want to type in Erie County Department of Environmental Planning Radon. If you put that in, Erie County Department of Environmental Planning Radon. If you put that in Google, uh, it'll spit out the, the radon office. And there's a really nice PDF file that will show you all the different places that have been tested and how high the readings have been. The thing for radon, and you might see a question on this, sometimes you get really unlucky and have a really hard exam. And uh, if you get a hard exam, they might ask you something like, how many picocuries of uh, air is too much as far as radon is concerned? And it's four. Four is the magic number. You want to be under four. 
because even at four picocuries per liter, it's called four picocuries per liter of air. That's how they measure it, okay? Four picocuries per liter of air. That's still the equivalent of smoking a half pack of cigarettes a day. And that's if you're a non-smoker. If you smoke, then you add that to what you're already smoking a day. So it's a problem. And you can see many, many thousands of tests that have been done and reported to the EPA, and they find its way back to Erie County. So if it's already a radon hotspot that you're selling properties in, then you might, uh, you know, odds are, if you're buying a home in that area that's identified as a hotspot, you probably have, uh, you probably have a radon issue or will have a radon issue. That's what a betting man would say at least, you know. Let's see if there's any questions here. Um, Rihanna asked, does more windows increase the value of a home? Um, you know, not exactly. It's not something we look for as an appraiser. There's no separate line for that that, it, that, uh, that we would respond to. Uh, the, the, but it turns out that if the windows are really, you know, beautiful custom windows or high quality windows, like high quality windows compared to basic, um, basic windows you might get at the, you know, the, Home Depot, you know, then it might, you know, it, 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 what it does as a, as an appraiser, I speak as an appraiser, is it increases the value. Uh, it, I should say it increases the quality rating. In other words, if you go around a house and you've got high quality trim, high quality tile, high quality wood, hardwood floors, you know, not, not the, the pressed down stuff that you get at Ollie's, you know, like you get high quality. Uh, it turns out it, it's expensive. It's th thousands of dollars just to do a small, tiny dining room. You know, if you do you have hardwood floors put in. If I, if I see lots of quality all around the house as I'm walking through it, then I'm going to compare that home to other homes that have been upgraded in a similar sort of way. You know, not not like dollar store quality improvements, but like, you know, the, the real custom expensive things raises a quality rating of the home, you know, and, and like in the world of appraising, you'll see that discussed as we go through it. Uh, probably not so much tonight, but we'll, we'll continue and get we'll get more done because I won't quiz you for so long on Tuesday. Um, but you'll see that uh, for the most part. Um, it, the, the lowest we have, well, okay, well, let me let me start. The most common quality rating we have in real estate is average. Good is the best. Fair is lower than average. And poor is the lowest quality rating. Okay? Turns out most real estate in the world is average. So you either want to be better than average. I mean, average is not bad. You know, most people say, oh, you know, you're average. No, a average is very common and typical. You shouldn't feel bad about average in terms of real estate. But you wouldn't compare um, an exclusive subdivision where it's triple the median price of homes and they're all newer to, to like a Ryan subdivision that's been around for 30 years. You know, that like that would be like a Ryan subdivision home, that'd be typically average would be the rating, you know, but a custom built home by Murano might be good. Depends, you know, like they have all different styles out there. Okay. You want to know that there's two roof framing methods, truss roof framing and joist and rafter framing. So if you had a question that asked, that, that said to you, uh, which of the following components makes up a truss uh, frame roof, you'd want to be able to know that we've got the web member, the W diagonals is what we call that. If the lower cord, the upper cord has got the gusset plates. Those are all the key attributes to know if you're looking at a truss framed roof. And the same goes with your uh, joist and rafter framing. Turns out that most homes in Western New York, you know, all the way through to Rochester, is joist and rafter framing because that's where you have a functional attic. When you've got the W diagonals, you're climbing, you're putting your foot over, you know, all the different diagonals there, and it's not a real effective attic. Uh, I mean, you do see them in manufactured homes, 
You know, manufactured homes often have that, but your typical stick built homes of Western New York are gonna be joist and rafter framing for the most part. Look in your home and tell me what you've got in your home and what you think it is. Okay, we'll talk about that next week. Um, the bottom of the page, we talk about the plumbing system. You've got the fresh water coming in, you've got the wastewater going out, and then you've got the part of the plumbing that people never really think about until a bird decides to put their nest right on top. So when you flush the toilet, it goes around and around and around, and just you just don't understand why it's not flushing. Don't call a plumber, but look at the vent stacks. The vent stacks may in fact be blocked, and that's the reason why the toilet's not flushing properly. So uh, that's the third part of the house plumbing system. You've got a lot of fast facts on page 150. Um, you're not tested on any of that six point or five point font that you see there. That's there to help you. So if you read that and you have a question, send us a text um, or we could talk about it next time. These are some of the different um, laws that apply to the transfer of real estate that I felt you should know as a real estate professional working in the area. And your office will also keep you abreast of things like that and changes that uh, you know come into play as well. So this is the most current information that we have available, okay? Uh, just check and see if there are any questions there. Okay. Question from Stephanie is, what's the tiny red light on a GFCI outlet? So that little tiny light on a GFCI outlet, um, it should be green actually, because if it's red, it often means, uh, these are all the ones I've seen, and I've seen a ton of them, uh, it means it's wired properly. Because if you have a GFCI outlet and it's not wired properly, that means it won't trip. And it might as well not be a GFCI then because it won't trip. It looks nice. It looks pretty and everything, but it's not going to do the job. It's not going to save you from getting a shock or get electrocuted. A couple things under electrical that I want you to know about. And sorry that we're running a bit late, but um, I think I think we're sharing a lot of information with you. So a uh, couple things with electrical, like uh, the wire gauge. Real popular state exam question. The higher the numerical number for wire gauge, the smaller the dimension of the wire. You should know that for test purposes. So if you have a wire gauge of 16 compared to a wire gauge of 12, you should know that 12 will be thicker, larger, compared to 16, which will be thinner, smaller, okay? That's important concept. And the reason why that's important is because if you try to put too many amps over a thin wire, the chance for a fire jumps exponentially. Very, very important. Amps, A-M-P-S, amps push volts. Most everything that you'll find in a residential home is about 110 to 120-ish volts. But it's the amps that matter. So when you're in a kitchen, you'll typically have 20 amps. When you're in a living room or an office, like, you know, if you have a den or an office, you'll have 15 amps. But some lines are higher even. You might have 30 amp for various items in your home. And I don't want to get into lots of home inspection things with you. So um, because we want the circuit breakers to trip when they're put under a particular load. And we want it to trip before the lot, before the wire starts on fire, because electrical fires are a big deal. Over 15,000 homes burn down every year in the US as a result of electrical related issues. So when I walk around a house and I see extension cords everywhere, the house is screaming at me that we have an issue here. And electrical, lots of electric cords is not a good thing, okay? Fuses, some people say, well, fuses, that's probably bad too. And yeah, it's, it's, it's bad. Number one, you might not even be able to qualify to get homeowner's insurance. So if you sell a house that has fuses compared to circuit breakers, you may not even be able to get 
insurance, or you'll pay a lot more for the insurance if you can find someone that will provide it. But your office will give you more information about that. You won't be tested on that information, okay? Um, heating system is discussed at the bottom of 150. You can give that a read through. Uh, the information that we had emailed you uh, earlier, uh, yesterday, for the most part, for most of you, we get into really lots of detail, lots of extra inserted videos for you. So um, kind of make sure you do that. With radiant heating, interesting state exam question at the top of 151. With radiant heating, uh, you'll see a question along the lines of uh, choose the option that reflects the type of heating system where pipes are embedded in walls and ceilings or floors. So when you, when you talk about embedded pipes in walls, floors, or ceilings, immediately you should think to yourself, radiant heating, okay? Page 152, we see an example of a heat pump. Heat pump looks a lot like a um, central air unit that you'd see. But the thing that's different about a heat pump is that it provides heat in the winter and cool in the summer but they're only effective to about 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Once you start dropping much below that, they don't really kick out a lot of heat. Interestingly enough, the, the state association of heat pump people come out of Rochester and there's a lot more money in heat pumps than there are other types of systems that you might find. So as you go further east in the state, you'll see that heat pumps are more popular compared to Western New York. In the middle of page 152, we talk about the home improvement law. Give that a cursory review. It talks about some of the basics that you should be familiar with. You don't always see lots of test questions from there. I can not tell you that I've seen one in a long time or heard about one, but give it a cursory review. You never know when you're gonna get one of those tough exams where you get this random question. You're like, oh, I don't remember that being emphasized. We really can't emphasize to you every single thing that'll be on the state exam because they don't tell us, they don't want you to, they don't want you to be prepared to pass the test based on uh, only knowing particular material. They want you to have a broad, deep understanding of everything. So that's why we're one of the schools that we don't teach you to the test. No tests. We don't do that with any tests. We don't do that with home inspection. It's not something that you should want, even though in a perfect world, that sounds great. You'll feel like you're, uh, you've been ripped off when you take the state exam. And you won't, you won't feel like that here. If you listen to the CD that you're given when you first sign up, you touch every page of your textbook, you should be reading every chapter that we cover uh, in your, uh, for the session that we have all the pages in the front of your book. For each session, everything that should be covered, you should read all of that on your own, not just what we overview in class. The DVD that you're given, you should watch that. And if you don't, if anything we give you doesn't work, you have to let us know so we can give you the alternative means. If you do everything we give you, there's no way you're going to fail this, the school exam. There's no way. There's no way you're going to fail the state exam. But you've got to do everything. You've got to do the online practice questions which are different from the ones in your textbook, not all different, but mostly different. You gotta do the crossword puzzles. Crossword puzzles are super important because give you those little short phrase trigger words so that when we do review like we did at the beginning of today, you do a better job. You'll remember things that way. It's a great way to make your flashcards as well. The bottom of 152, we talk about the new construction warranty law. You should know the one year, two year, and six year, what's covered under each. Be familiar with that. And then we've got questions that follow. Then we talk about valuation principles on 155. I'm doing on time. Let me see if there's any questions. The Gino had a question. Is one type of roof framing better than the other in terms of home value? Um, it's not so much in types of roof framing are better. Like I know that uh, I would say to you that a home with a, you know, we talk about framing, we're talking about the arc, we're talking about the um, 
you don't mix up style with framing, okay? Most homes will have joist and rafter wood framed roofs. Um, truss framed roofs are not bad. They're just not as effect, efficient as far as for storage, okay? But a hipped roof, I would pick a hipped roof for style purposes over a gable, definitely over a mansard roof. So most higher quality homes, especially in a lot of the new subdivisions around East Amherst and Williamsville, uh, you know, all areas near the school, I'd say to you have uh, have a hip roof and they're, they're, they're architecturally, visually appealing as well, you know? And, and they cost more. There's a lot more engineering that goes into a hip roof compared to just a basic gable style roof. So page 155, we talk about valuation principles. Give this a cursory review. In general, if you provide a value, you're considered to be providing an appraisal. And you're not supposed to do that unless you have an appraisal license. Most real estate agents, they provide a range of value. If you provide a range of value, then you're in a good position to not violate any ethics or state law, okay? So uh, I'm a state certified general appraiser. Uh, I've been one for a long time, and that's the one that lets you appraise anything regardless of value, you know? Uh, it could be $5 million, $1 million, nuclear power plant, ranch in Chictawaga, you name it. Um, it's a it's a great license to have. I've had it for a long time. And uh, and I've appraised all different types of properties, you know, not just residential. I've done lots of residential, high-end, low-end, average. Um, at Chautauqua Institute, I've done, you know, some spectacular properties, uh, properties you couldn't even imagine that were spectacular because they're all hidden back in the woods and, uh, you know, you name it, I've seen it. So um, we talk about different uh, appraisal terms that you should know. Make sure that you read through them. Um, they have shown up on the state exam. Uh, in particular, I'll tell you which ones to spend a little time with. Uh, direct costs, the one that I've seen before. The definition for feasibility studies I would be familiar with. Plottage. Please note plottage. That shows up quite a bit. Small plots of land that are combined to form a larger plot. That's a definition of plottage. Value in use is often a multiple choice throwaway option. So I would read that one over. Uh, most everything on 158 is just a cursory review. Uh, one thing in particular I want to tell you is scarcity. There's only so much land available. This is why real estate has value, okay? Um, of course, you've heard location, location, location is really important. Then the types of improvements, and that gets into quality. It gets into, you know, um, you know, everyone's got a bathroom, but everyone's bathroom doesn't necessarily have the same types of improvements in there you know some people have a bidet some people have a separate shower compared to a tub some people don't even have a tub let me tell you one thing about a bathroom to have a full bath you've got to have three components three to have a half bath you need two so when you go into a basement and you see a toilet and you don't see a sink or a shower or anything else you don't have a bathroom. That's not a bathroom. That, that's a that's a that's a that's a nothing burger. Okay, uh, you've got to have um, yeah, you've got to have three items to make it a full bath. Oh, and by the way, some of you might have heard of a phrase called a three quarter bath. That is that is old as a hills, old fashioned term. We don't use that. Okay, so we don't say that there's three quarter baths. It's full or half. All right. There's also, be familiar with regression and progression. Read those over carefully. We do address that in more detail on the uh, item you were emailed. Economic characteristics of real estate, we talk about supply and demand. You know, lots of homes on the market, that's a lot of supply. If you don't have a lot of demand, then that's gonna push the values down. But if there's few homes on the market and 
lots of buyers, then that's going to raise the value. It's going to raise the value. And we also talk about whether, you, you know, when we talk about regression above, don't confuse that with the economic characteristics because regression is, when we talk about regression and progression, we're talking about the concepts that are so close to the concept of you never want to buy the best home on the street. You always want to buy the worst home or the one that's not at the higher end of the range because that's how you get the most value out of your house if you can. You don't want to be the best home on the street because then when you turn around and sell your house, the other ones are bringing you down. That's the concepts addressed on 158. So that's where we're going to stop tonight.